Last week, in the immediate aftermath of the FBI's raid on Mar-a-Lago, we discussed on this show the potential corruption, the potential abuses that could have taken place at the DOJ and the FBI and the White House and all over the political culture that called this raid. Now, with the hindsight of one week, we can say with certainty that the corruption and abuse was much, much worse. This is Verdict with Ted Cruz. This episode of Verdict with Ted Cruz is sponsored by American Hartford Gold. If you're like me, then you are growing more and more concerned about the state of our country and about your own future. Inflation is at the highest rate that we've seen in 40 years, and interest rates are skyrocketing. In fact, market experts like Jamie Dimon, who is the CEO of JP Morgan, are not only predicting that we will face an economic recession, they're using phrases like economic hurricane and unprecedented. If you want to protect your future, then do what I did. Call the only precious metal dealers that I trust, American Hartford Gold. They can show you how to hedge your hard-earned savings against inflation by diversifying a portion of your portfolio into physical gold and silver. All it takes to get started is a short phone call, and they'll have physical gold and silver shipped directly to your door or perhaps into your IRA or 401 K. And they make it easy. They're the highest rated firm in the business with an A plus rating from the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied clients. And if you call them right now, they will give you up to $1,500 of free silver and a free safe on your first qualifying order. So don't wait. Call them now. Call 855 768 1883. That's 855-768-1883. Or if you prefer text messaging, you can text the word CACTUS to 65532. Again, the phone number is 855-768-1883, or you can send the word CACTUS via text message to 65532. You'll be glad you did. Welcome back to Verdict with Ted Cruz. I'm Michael Knowles. So grateful to all of you who have subscribed to this podcast. And I'm absolutely furious at those of you who have not subscribed. So come on, let's rectify things right now. You can subscribe, Apple Podcast, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast, YouTube, and of course, over at Verdict Plus on Locals. Senator, last week, We were shooting from the hip. The the information was constantly changing about the Mar-a-Lago raid. We were told initially it was over classified documents. Then we were told it might be over nuclear secrets. Then that kind of seemed to fall apart given the timing of the warrants and the raid and the fact that we're already 18, 19 months into the Biden administration. Now we've got the hindsight of one week. Is there any justification for the raid? No good one. Uh, what is really distressing, looking now at, at, at the warrant uh, and what they were searching for, this was a fishing expedition. It was an old-fashioned fi- fishing expedition. I actually think it had li- little to nothing to do with, with classified documents. Uh, what this was about was January 6th. Hmm. What this was about was the FBI and DOJ wanting to send in a team to say, let's grab every piece of paper we can find. And maybe we'll get something incriminating. And look, that's not a new thing for law enforcement to do. Sometimes, you know, if you're going after Al Capone, you try to go after him on income tax evasion. Um, It's not new for law enforcement to try to find a hook. And so the classified documents, the presidential records, they had a hook to say, well, he may have brought a piece of paper or maybe multiple pieces of paper that we've asked for back. And so we've got a claim to, to, to send in the troops. I got to say, though, look, we have a long tradition in this country of a peaceful transfer of power. By the way, we said that in the last pod, and it was very funny. Lefties on Twitter lost their mind. No, no, no. You're not allowed to say that. No, no. We say peaceful transfer of power. Don't you say that. No, 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 no. Let me explain. In banana republics, tin pot dictators send their troops in to the home of the prior guy, or as they like to call Trump, the former guy. When you send your troops in to raid the home of your predecessor, looking for evidence, because your plan is to try to lock him up. What I can tell you is in 200 plus years of our nation's history, no president has ever done that to his predecessor. Not once, none of them. Look, each of our presidents, when the party shifted, they didn't necessarily love their predecessors. Um, 
Jefferson and Adams despised e- each other, but it's not like Jefferson said, all right, let's bust down the door of Ad- Adams' house and see what we can find. That doesn't happen. Listen, it is certainly true that the laws apply to everyone, including former presidents. And if they violate criminal laws, they should be held accountable. That being said, when there's a specter of using the law enforcement machinery to target your enemies, the threshold should be much, much higher. It shouldn't be a ticky-tack crime. It shouldn't be a little threshold. It should be something that is exercised only when there is no alternative. Crossfire hurricane, they sent in the wiretaps, they sent in, in, in the investigations on the flimsiest predicate, and then they created fraudulent documents to back up that predicate. And all of it, of course, was funded by the Hillary Clinton campaign, which multiple members of DOJ and FBI knew and didn't care about. Fast forward to now. What happened here? I think they're frustrated because their January 6th investigation's not getting anywhere. And so they said, well, look, we got an excuse to go raid Trump. Let's go do it, and maybe we'll find some documents. Maybe we'll go on a fishing exercise. That is an absolute abuse of power. If they're going to say that Trump is Hitler, as they've been saying for years now, then they have to do absolutely anything they can to stop Hitler. He's Hitler, after all. And uh, if that involves breaking some laws or if that involves abusing government power, well, who cares? That's a small price to pay, I think, as they see it. The FBI does an enormous amount of good work. The FBI uh, catches targets terrorists, radical Islamic terrorists trying to murder people. It catches bank robbers. It catches people who engage in in child kidnapping. It, it, It catches mafia bosses. Like the FBI is a hugely important law enforcement agency. And I gotta tell you, within the FBI, there are thousands and thousands of good and honorable law enforcement officers, people who signed up to be cops, people who signed up to catch bad guys because they wanted to protect America and keep us safe. And what is so infuriating is is those FBI agents, their entire career and life is being cheapened, is being undermined by these political hacks who are leading the Department of Justice and who are at the senior levels of the FBI. I, I cannot think of anybody in modern times who's done more to damage the credibility of the FBI and the Department of Justice than Merrick Garland, because when he turns them into a nakedly political group of stormtroopers, it's not the the agent's fault. It's the politicized leadership's fault, and he is hurting the FBI and hurting the Department of Justice, and, and... It ought to scare the hell out of him. Instead of lecturing people, how dare you say abolish the FBI? Look, they're saying it because (laughs) you're a partisan hack. Mm -hmm. Why are they saying it, of course, is the question. And as as you mentioned, they went in there with the charge to take pretty much everything they could. They're searching Melania Trump's wardrobe. They went in, they, they took Donald Trump's passports, for goodness sakes, two expired passports and his current diplomatic passport. And then, of course, immediately CBS News denies this, says that Trump is lying about his passports. And then five minutes later, the DOJ was caught with egg on its face. They had to admit they did, in fact, take Trump's passports. And then they returned them to him. So so now, of course, the line is uh, the DOJ, the FBI never took Trump's passports and don't worry, they gave them back. Uh, all of this really, really uh, reducing the credibility of the FBI and the DOJ. And as, as you suggest, this isn't about classified documents. This isn't about the Presidential Records Act. This isn't about the nuclear codes. This is about January 6th and the failure of the January 6th committee, the Republican face, the nominally Republican face of the January 6th committee, Liz Cheney, is almost certainly going to go down in flames tonight. We're recording this on Tuesday night. All of the polls say she's going to be ousted from office. Uh, so it's that's just not working. There, there was also, Senator, I don't know if you saw a really interesting 
article in Revolver News about the pipe bombs on January 6th. We've heard so much about the grannies that went into the Capitol. We've heard so much about the horn hat guy. We've heard so much from the J6 committee. We haven't heard a whole lot about those pipe bombs, and, and we don't really know who planted the pipe bombs. And it seems like that would be pretty important when we're talking about the, the, that day. This would be the, the nearest that you got to serious political violence on January 6th, and yet we've heard nothing. So there's a Revolver News report out that suggests that there are really more questions than answers when it comes to these pipe bombs, why they were allegedly planted when they were, why the FBI isn't releasing footage of the people planting it to try to figure out who actually did it. Just a whole, I'll just leave it at that, a whole lot of really strange aspects to this story. And then the strangest one of all you called out when you were grilling the FBI director, Christopher Wray, which is that the former head of the Detroit office for the FBI, this guy, Stephen Don, I've got Dan Tuono is his name. He was in charge of the operation to entrap people into trying to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer, the Democrat governor of Michigan. And this was a complete cluster, didn't work. The trial's going on right now. It's just a complete mess for the FBI. Shortly after that all fell apart, Stephen D'Antuono got a promotion. He was brought over, this would be in the months before January 6th, to head up the Washington field office for the FBI. This is one of the most prestigious posts you can have in the bureau. And so therefore, he's the guy that's overseeing the investigation into January 6th. All of this has me scratching my head, Senator. I know it had you scratching yours, which is why you grilled Christopher Wray. Well, Michael, that's exactly right. And you got a lot of a lot of substance in that question. So let me try to take it one piece at a time. And, and let me say at the outset, it is interesting Literally every single topic we are discussing in this podcast, every single topic that is leading the news right now is in my new book, Justice Corrupted, uh, which you can pre-order right now on Amazon. Uh, it's coming out in just a few weeks. In Justice Corrupted, I go into depth about Crossfire Hurricane and, and, and the partisan animus that led to that bogus investigation. I go into depth into January 6th and the pipe bomber and the investigation and the politicization of the investigation. I go into depth on the Gretchen Whitmer uh, absolute debacle and, and, and explain how all of this is interconnected. Let, let's start with a pipe bomb. Look, the FBI and the Department of Justice should be focused on criminals. It should be focused on people who commit crimes of violence. We saw all during Antifa and Black Lives Matter riots where the federal government essentially turned a blind eye because many of the hyper-partisan senior leaders at the Department of Justice and the FBI, even under Donald Trump, the burrowed-in career leaders who remained hard leftists, agreed with the politics of the rioters and the violent criminals and so gave them slaps on the wrist over and over again as they engaged in in violent acts of terror, firebombing police cars, uh, um, looting stores, murdering uh, officers because of the politics they disregarded violence. On January 6th, Merrick Garland has claimed it is the largest and most significant investigation in the history of the FBI. Like, Holy crap, like, really? Like, in the history of the FBI, so more than 9-11, like, like planes flying into the World Trade Center, flying into the Pentagon, 3,000 people murdered. This was more serious, and, and the reason it's more serious is because for them, it's all about politics. Who are they targeting? They're targeting the little old ladies who were on the mall waving American flags, singing God Bless America. They're targeting, ultimately, Every American who voted for Donald Trump, who spoke out in favor of Donald Trump, this is a political persecution. The White House sees it that way, just like the raid. The raid was a political persecution. It's not about violence. Now, you look at January 6th, one action that, that on the face of it certainly appears to be a crime of violence and was an attempt at a serious terrorist attack are the two pipe bombs. The pipe bombs had dedicated uh, detonated on Capitol Hill, potentially killing dozens or, or more, that would have been a horrific act of violence. Now, thankfully, neither pipe bomb detonated. If you look at everything that transpired that day, you would think a multiple attempted bombing in the nation's capital would be really high on the priority list of let's get someone that's trying to blow people up and murder people. Like that, you know, between blow people up and murder people and little old lady waving a flag, maybe blow people up and murder people would be a higher priority in any sane world. We're now 
you know, almost two years after the fact. And we know nothing about the pipe bomber. Apparently there's video of it. Apparently the pipe bomber dropped the bombs off at 8 p.m. the night before. They have video of it. If they've ever caught the guy, they've never told anyone. There's no case. There's no prosecution. Apparently the guy with the horns is a massive threat to the cosmos. But a ostensibly homicidal bomber, no concern, nothing to see here. It is weird. When the DOJ or the FBI is before the Judiciary Committee, I asked them about it. And they consistently refused to answer. Nothing to see here. Nope, never mind the bomber. We don't care. Not our focus. Nope. Not. Their attitude is we don't have to answer your questions. Yeah. And it's not just we don't answer to Congress. It's we don't answer the American people. We decide what we want to do and no one dares question us. And look, this Revolver article, I, I don't know how accurate or not it is. It raises questions. The implication is that the pipe bombs uh, were not actually planted by real criminals, but were part of a, a fraud, some sort of entrapment or hoax. I, I don't know. I want to be cautious about suggesting that. But I will say this, when law enforcement, A, doesn't make it a priority to target actual violent criminals, and B, answers no questions, has no transparency, and behaves as if they have no accountability, they shouldn't be surprised when they have no credibility and people don't trust them. Well, and especially on this issue, Senator, of, of Stephen D'Antuono, I mean, to me, that's the craziest part of all. Forget the fact that the, the, the timers on the bombs apparently were not functioning, the timing wouldn't have made a whole lot of sense. Forget any of the questions that were, were raised by that. The very fact that a guy who we know led an entrapment campaign, a, a poorly orchestrated entrapment campaign, by the way, in Michigan, then becomes the head of the Washington field office. I, I think we have the clip of your grilling Ray, because initially Ray tries to deny it, and then you've laid out the facts, and, and he can't help but admit that you're right. There was the case against individuals charged with kidnapping and murdering Governor Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan. Well, the special agent in charge of that case has now been sent to D.C., to the Washington, D.C. office, and now leads the investigation regarding January 6th. Is that correct? That doesn't sound right to me. That does not sound right. The, the, the name of the individual is Stephen D'Antuno. He was, he was run out of the FBI Detroit field office. Okay. And by the way, I will point okay. out that the lead investigator, Special Agent Track, are you aware that he was apparently fired? <laughs> for allegedly beating his wife after coming home from a swingers party and he'd made multiple derogatory political posts about President Trump showing political bias. Are you aware of that? I am aware of, I think, the incident you're describing uh, and action that was taken about it. Uh, to clarify on the first part of your question, uh, Mr. D'Antuano was the special agent in charge of the office, uh, the Detroit field office, and is now the assistant director in charge of the Washington field office. I thought you were asking about the agent who was responsible for the... So the guy in charge got promoted and is now in charge of the January 6th investigation. The guy in charge of the whole Detroit field office is now in charge of the whole Washington field office. That is astonishing. He, he tries to get out of it, Senator. He says, oh, I don't know. I'm not really familiar. What are you talking about? I'm talking about this guy. I'm naming this name, this date, this office. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess he got the promotion. So, so and, and it's worth unpacking that for a little bit. And, and let's start out with what happened in Michigan. So if you remember in the fall of 2020, right before a big election, uh, the FBI breathlessly announces that they've uncovered a plot to kidnap and murder the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. Now, that's a big damn deal. You're like, holy cow. All right, if you've got a plot to do that, like go prosecute those guys, throw them in jail a long time. Thank you, FBI, for like stopping criminals. That's your job. Now, I'll point out at the same time that that prosecution happened to perfectly align with the political narrative of Joe Biden and the Democrats because these, these alleged criminals – we're doing it because they were mad about Gretchen Whitmer's COVID lockdown policies. And, and because Trump had criticized Whitmer, the whole narrative was, you know what? It's Trump's fault. See, any Trump supporter is a violent criminal. Look, those guys are literally trying to kidnap and murder a Democratic governor. So it fit the political narrative beautifully, which, by the way, the corrupt corporate media got, ran with, danced, celebrated, said, see, 
unless you are a violent murderer too, you better vote for Joe Biden. That was what it was all about. All right, fast forward to the actual trial. Four guys go on trial. They're charged with various crimes all related to an alleged plot to kidnap and murder Gretchen Whitmer. The end of the trial in federal court, the four de- defendants are convicted of zero counts, nothing. Two of them are acquitted across the board. The jury comes back and says, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. Two of them have hung juries. So the juries can't agree. And so they have mistrials declared. So in the course of the the trial, the prosecution gets zero convictions on anything. Now, in any prosecution, that's a big deal. That's a big, serious problem. Prosecution wins almost every case they bring. Typically, the prosecutors don't bring a case unless they can get you and they've got the evidence. So it's unusual for the prosecution to lose. But it's even worse than that. Why did they lose? Well, the principal defense from the defendants was entrapment. It was that the FBI informants, people who were on the payroll of the FBI, who were working for the federal government, that they were the ones that suggested the damn thing. They were the ones that kept urging him to do that. In fact, the defendants pressed back, said, hey, let's not do this. This is a bad idea. Let's let's not kidnap and murder the governor. Gosh, your idea is interesting, but no thank you. And the FBI agents or the undercover uh, informants kept saying, no, 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 no. We got to do this. Really important, really important we kidnap her, really important we murder her. And that was the defendant's defense's arguments, and apparently the jury agreed. That was the principal defense put forward. Now, for any law enforcement, look, there's a general line. What are the rules co- co- governing undercover officers? Law enforcement all the time has undercover officers. You go in, you go into the mob, you go into a drug cartel, you have someone undercover who pretends to be part of it, and you can gather evidence, and that can be used in a prosecution. That's legitimate. What is not legitimate, the line, is you can't engage in entrapment. You can't be the one who is the source, the genesis of the illegal conduct, that, that it is an abuse of government power when they send an, an agent to you and say, hey, Michael, don't you really want to steal that, that uh, fancy watch from behind? The, like, they can't go suggest to citizens they break the law. The guy in charge, so this was all run out of the Detroit field office, the guy in charge of it, Stephen D'Antuano. This is one of the biggest scandals in the history of the FBI. Hmm. To lose a marquee, front page, top of the fold, banner headline case because of misconduct by your office. In any sane and ordinary and responsible law enforcement office, everyone involved would have been fired. That, that, that's just the, like, like the level of scandal. You didn't just screw it up. It was your misconduct yeah. that messed it all up. The fact that in this FBI, the guy, A, doesn't get fired, B, gets promoted, but C, gets put in charge of the January 6th prosecution. Are you friggin' kidding me? I, I, I mean, that is... As I said at the end of that cross-examination, it is astonishing. And what it is, Michael, is it's a manifestation of that hubris. He's like, well, it it was the line line agents that did that. You know, whatever happened to Harry S. Truman, the buck stops here. Apparently, no one has accountability for anything. No one's fired. No one's reprimanded. Nothing happens. Well, I guess the line agents, the guy in charge who allegedly beat his wife and was running around at swingers convention, so, you know, really speaks to the caliber of folks yeah Uh, you know he lost his job but his boss got promoted that there is unfortunately a culture and i trace it back to the obama years where the obama years they viewed doj and the fbi as their political stormtroopers and what they did they promoted from within hard partisans into senior positions and they burrowed in, and unfortunately, there are far too many of them that are still there. 
And it raises a whole lot of red flags. I mean, if you get a guy who was in charge of an operation that involved entrapment and hoaxes and misconduct, and then he, he gets the promotion, he goes to Washington, D.C., already there are a lot of questions about that day. Uh, one of the chief instigators among the people to say, go in, we have to go into the Capitol, we've got to storm the Capitol. When he did that in the streets of Washington, the people around him said, Fed, 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 he's a Fed. All the strange yeah. questions about the pipe bombs. It, it just, it's just not a good look, okay? And you add on top of that the fact that there has been such misconduct, such abuse of power, such corruption at the FBI and the DOJ going back to Crossfire Hurricane and and the subsequent events. I just, it, when people don't have faith in federal law enforcement and the political leadership of federal law enforcement, that's not our fault, okay? <laughs> that's the fault of the people who squandered that credibility. And, you know, Michael, what's amazing is the Democrats who have majorities in Congress have zero interest in discovering what happened. So it's been a year and a half. We've had no hearings on the Gretchen Whitmer case, on the entrapment, on, on the disastrous debacle of that case, because the Democrats have, are not interested in knowing what happened. They're quite happy. Look, the, the cross-examination I had of, of Chris Ray. No Democrat had any interest in following up on that. They're like, oh, good. The guy involved in entrapment is now in charge of January 6th. Hey, work for Perfect. us. Awesome. <laughs> like, like it, it is amazing. And I will say one of the things that underscores the stakes of this election in November, if Republicans take a majority in both houses, we need to have hearings on these topics. We need to have hearings on every one of these topics. We need to examine. We need to use subpoenas. We need to drag Merrick Garland and Chris Ray down there and keep them there and make them answer questions, not let them get away with this blithe, um, you know, I, I, I am the king. I answer to nobody, which is the attitude they have. And I very much hope, A, that we win in November, but B, that we see that accountability. Of course, it's it's urgent, too, because they're busting into the doors at Mar-a-Lago today. But it really could be anyone who's considered a political enemy of uh, our ruling class. Now, it's not only the Democrats who don't want you talking about this sort of stuff, Senator. It is even the fake Republicans. I, ha I saw this headline. I have got to get your reaction to it. This is from Michael Steele. Michael Steele was the head of the Republican <laughs> National Committee. Now he's a talking head on MSNBC, and he only ever goes on the liberal shows and attacks Republicans. He said, this is directed at you, Senator, just sit the hell down, please. Stop it. This in response to your speech at CPAC says, it is more fascism than farce. It is more concern than conservatism, and it really is about how we as a citizen respond to this, how we push back against it, blah, 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 Cruz is the worst. Uh, any response? <laughs> uh, I will say that's a badge of honor. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Um, look, I'd say it's three things simultaneously. One, there's a whole cadre of squishy, moderate establishment Republicans who barely believed anything to begin with. And, and they were a real problem in our party for a long time. They gave rise to my election, they gave rise to the rise of Donald Trump. It was a reaction to uh, the, these, these folks who didn't believe anything. Secondly, that many of those same folks are now fully consumed by TDS, by Trump derangement syndrome. They just hate Donald Trump so much that they're, they're consumed by it. You mentioned Liz Cheney. Liz Cheney is unrecognizable from who she was you know, five, six years ago, Bill Crystal. Bill Crystal used to be Dan Quayle's chief of staff. Yeah. He, he ran the Weekly Standard, which was a conservative publication. He now is indistinguishable from a raving left-wing Democrat. It's also worth remembering, Bill Crystal discovered Sarah Palin. I know that now uh, Bill and other people on the kind of squishy side or just outright now have switched to the left. They, they try to say Palin's the problem, Cruz, Trump, all these right-wingers in the conservative movement. Bill Crystal discovered that lady and made her a national thing. Well, and what's funny, it's not just the folks that are destroyed by TDS. It's not just that they don't like what Trump says or does. It's not just that they say, well, we need to speak with greater decorum. You can make that case. They become left-wingers on everything. They, 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 they look at, at Build Back Broke and say, woohoo, raise taxes, spend money, more debt. I mean, I mean their rhetoric 
is indistinguishable from Chuck Schumer's. I mean, they, they, they literally have just flipped over. And then the third dynamic is, is Steele, who I don't know the guy, but, you know, apparently makes a living now going on MSNBC. And there's a whole little cottage industry of, of quote, former Republicans yeah. who get paid to go on TV and their job description is simple. You, you have to do two things. Number one, you have to at some time have called yourself a Republican. And he helps because he was actually head of the RNC. So he's got a good, good sort of fake costume there. Yeah. But then two, you have to be willing to piss on Republicans all day long. Like they have no interest in reasoned analysis. They have no interest in you're actually considering substance. Your job is I am former Republican who says Republicans all suck. That's what I get paid to do on MSNBC. And it's how I get my measly little paycheck to pay the second mortgage on, on my condo in old town, Virginia. Um, that is a phenomenon, um, and 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 it's an it's an unfortunate and silly one. And by the way, what he was reacting to was my speech at CPAC. The central thesis of which is revival is coming. That this administration has gone so extreme, people's eyes are opening up, and they want to take the country back in the direction of free enterprise and freedom and defending the Constitution and Bill of Rights. And what is his response to that? Sit the hell down and shut up. <laughs> uh, okay, Boomer. Uh, thanks for your input. You screwed it up. Now's time for actually people who believe something to to lead. Well, that is the key. I, you'll sometimes hear this. I, I always hear this with ex-Catholics, or I don't even know if you'd say ex-Catholic, but you'll sometimes hear people say whenever pontificating on some matter of the church, they'll say, listen, I went to Catholic school, and let me tell you, and you can be certain every time someone says that, they don't know anything about the Catholic Church. And I think it's almost the perfect analogy for it. They'll say, listen, as a former Republican, and then they go on and they misrepresent Republicans' views. They frequently can't yep. articulate them at all. And be, because I think in 99 times out of 100, they never really believed that stuff to begin with. They never really knew what they were supposed to believe to begin with. And so it was a natural evolution for them to move over to the other side. I see that with virtually all of these so-called former Republicans. They're just kind of squishes who opportunistically were in the GOP while it served them. But because they didn't really believe very much on life, on liberty, <laughs> on the American way of life, that they, they just switched when the going got tough. And so when they leave the party, I say, good, sayonara, glad, don't let the door hit you on the way out. By the way, did you see there was a really weird article in the last week from, from some, I think CBS or I don't know, some media outlet uh, uh, about praying the rosary as a tool of extremist <laughs> hate. That was it, in the it Atlantic. It was like the most, okay, it, it, it was, it was so bizarre. I actually assumed it was Babylon B. Like, <laughs> like it was like, okay, this is actually pretty good satire. Like I get this is really making fun of crazy lefties, except they write it anyway. Like, like they're just, it is making comedy harder because they will say, any asinine thing, but what was your reaction to, to, all right, I'm going to play the straight man here. Michael is praying the rosary, <laughs> a tool of extremist hate. Well, I, I actually have a high capacity rosary. So my rosary has, <laughs> has uh, 50 uh, Hail Marys on it, but not just that. We've got some Our Fathers. We got some Glory Bees. Now the, the rosary uh, has been around for what, roughly a thousand years and, and really even earlier than that because the there were earlier forms of what became the rosary, Christian prayer beads, going back to the very earliest days of the church. And the Atlantic, whoever wrote this column, obviously doesn't know anything about that. In the subheader, they actually referred to the rosary as a sacrament. And again, you don't need to be a doctor of the church to know that the, the rosary is not a sacrament. Seven sacraments of the church, rosary beads are, are not one of them. And so they, they broadcast their ignorance basically from the headline of the piece, but then they spout off on it anyway, because the author, just like so many liberals, is frequently wrong, but never in doubt. And, and what is this about? I mean, I think they actually have a really clear political motivation here. They want to cast anything that is Christian as uh, extreme or terrorism. And so when you see, when you see, as frequently occurs, Little old nuns praying outside of a Planned Parenthood, playing, praying their rosaries, 
Why, that's a symbol of terrorism. That's a great threat to the country. We better call law enforcement out on them. We've got to suppress these symbols of hate. So I'm, I'm holding on to my beads. They are not registered. And uh, Molon Lave, that's what I say about my rosary. Come and take it. Well, and, and to be fair, though, the, the, you know, I guess the Atlantic does have a point. If I remember correctly, one of the Godfather movies, <laughs> one of the assassins was, was dressed as a priest and carrying the rosary mm-hmm. and committed murder. So, that's a so good point. there we go. QED, mm-hmm. they've proven in their case. <laughs> this, it, it's so, uh, it's so <laughs> preposterous. It, it, it's the only thing that one can do is sort of laugh at it and pray, I guess, yeah. is the, the other thing that we can do. But they're, they're revealing such a degree of ignorance and such a degree of hypocrisy frequently. It, it, there's one story I have to get to before, before I let you go, which, which combines all of these things. In New York, my home state, in Washington, D.C., a place where you spend a lot of time, where I spend a lot of time too, These are sanctuary cities. These are places that say we are open to immigrants, specifically illegal immigrants, no borders, no people are illegal, come here. And so then the governor of your state, Senator, decided to take them up on their offer. And he said, okay, we've got uh, historic numbers of illegal aliens pouring across the border, probably going to be more than 2 million this year. And uh, so that's fine. If you want to take them New York, you want to take them D.C., put them on a bus for free, uh, the governor's paying for it, and ships them up to New York. The mayors of New York and D.C. are absolutely losing their minds over it. They're saying this is terrible. They're saying this puts a strain on the resources of these cities. It's a horrific thing to do. And I thought, hold on, wait a, wait a minute. I was previously told by these very same mayors and politicians that illegal immigration is a net contributor to our economy. And it's really great and it's really wonderful. And it doesn't put a stress on any of our resources and it doesn't bring crime or anything else. But now they're saying not in my backyard, that illegal immigration is really great in the Republican states. It's not good in the blue cities that encourage it. Uh, you know, I got to say this story reveals, as, as you said, the fear and ignorance and the absolute hypocrisy of the left. Uh, so the mayors of both D.C. and New York have been holding press conferences, hysterical press conferences. Uh, the mayor of D.C., Muriel Browser, has said, uh, said that the 6,000 illegal immigrants that Texas has put on buses and sent up to D.C. has created a crisis, uh, and it is unacceptable and it has to stop. Now, that's just 6,000. Since Joe Biden has become president, three and a half million illegal immigrants have crossed the border. We have towns in South Texas um, that have seen massive hundreds of thousands, millions of people coming through. She says 6,000 is a crisis. Um, I publicly urge the governor, if she thinks 6,000 is a crisis, we ought to send 600,000. Yeah. 600,000 would be roughly one-sixth of the number, number of illegal immigrants who have come in under Joe Biden. By the way, if she doesn't like it, She is a member of a party, the Democrat Party. The person responsible for these three and a half million dollars lives in her city in Washington, D.C. I can give her uh, his address at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. His name is Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. He made a political decision to let three and a half million illegal immigrants in. His view was Texas, if it destroys communities in red states, that's great. Eventually, these folks will vote Democrat, he believes. So to, so let there be lots of suffering and misery and poverty. Let there be children sexually assaulted. Let there be women trapped in sex slavery. Let there be horrific abuse and disease and crime. All of that because politics is worth it. If she wants to fix it, the leader of her party can fix it anytime he damn well wants by simply choosing to follow the law. Now, Eric Adams, the, 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 the mayor of New York, in some ways, it's even funnier. He's, he's done these hysterical press conferences, losing his mind, saying, please stop sending illegal immigrants to New York. Um, and he's threatened. He said, I'm going to send busloads of New Yorkers to go to Texas <laughs> to campaign against Greg Abbott for governor. Now, I have to admit, I did have some great joy responding and said, well, actually, to be fair, there are already thousands of busloads <laughs> of New Yorkers fleeing New York and coming to Texas. And, and Eric Adams is driving them away. Now, they're coming to Texas because we're an oasis of freedom and New York is run by left-wing numbnuts who are trying to recreate the hellscape of the 70s. Yep. Um, you know, it's like escape from New York. Uh, Snake Plissken is going to have to sneak in and and break people out of New York to go to paradises uh, like Texas or Florida. Um, 
But secondly, you got to say, Eric Adams, I think he might be slightly off in his assessment of the politics of Texas because he thinks a bunch of left-wing New York Democrats coming down to Texas saying, hi, we're New Yorkers, please vote against your Republican governor. That (laughs) that is somehow going to cause Texans to go, oh, okay, we want our state to suck as much as you've screwed your city up, so let's do that. It is absurd, and here's a final point. I'm very glad Greg Abbott is doing it. It's the right thing to do. He ought to accelerate it massively. As you know, Abbott and I are good friends. I worked for him five and a half years. Um, I had urged him to do this. And in fact, I filed legislation that said we shouldn't just ship them to New York and D.C. We ought to ship illegal immigrants to Martha's Vineyard. We ought to (laughs) ship them to Nantucket. (laughs) Right. We ought to ship them to Southampton. We ought to ship them to Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, where where Biden vacations. We ought to ship them to Cupertino, California. Every place that rich liberals sit and swirl Chardonnay, they ought to sit there and watch busload after busload after busload of illegal immigrants unloading. And and, and by the way, uh, the the Martha, Martha Vineyard mayor, like publicly engaged me and said, oh, we would love that. We would welcome it. <laughs> really? Call like, my vet. Don't play chicken, with mayor. The 6, L- let's just start with the 6,000 that went to Washington, D.C. It, it reveals the utter hypocrisy of the left. They're willing to cause human suffering as long as it doesn't impinge on the view from their golf course. I'm just picturing it when, it, when it comes to the busloads of New Yorkers campaigning against the Republicans, and t- I'm picturing my cousin Vinny, you know, knock, knock on the door. Hey, you hear about all these Utes they're shipping up? The, all these well, all these Utes, you know, they're shipping them up. It's not going to be very persuasive. And the thing you're bringing up, by the way, Senator, it, I, it was uh, just described by Mike Anton over at the Claremont Institute, I thought in a really good way. He describes it as the the celebration parallax, a parallax being the Hmm. uh, position of an object seen from different vantage points. And uh, he says that what the liberals are doing now is they're saying something. And then when the conservatives simply restate what what the liberals have said, the liberals deny that. The liberals get to celebrate it. The conservatives, when they say it, are punished for it. And you see it in this case, the liberals are saying illegal immigration is putting a massive strain on the resources of our cities when it shows up here. And so we really just want to limit illegal immigration to the red states. And then, and this is a cause for celebration. The conservatives go out and they say, hey, illegal immigration is putting a huge strain on our resources and you just want to limit it to our states. And they say, how dare you? That's evil. That's a lie. That's fake news. That's inhumane. They're saying exactly the same thing. The question is just who is allowed to say it? It's an awfully good question, but I will say it is a question that are ca- is causing people's eyes to open up. It is causing them to see the hypocrisy that is leading to a re- revival in November, and that is causing folks like our friend Michael Steele to lose their mind. Yeah. Now, one one question before I let you go. This is from our mailbag. I don't want to let our wonderful Verdict Plus subscribers down. This question is from Adam Baum, 1750. Love a great pun. This question... Very, very important, especially compared to all the stuff we've been talking about today. What's your favorite band? What's my favorite band? So I'm not terribly musically literate. So it's, a, it's actually a complicated question. Um, I grew up as a kid listening to classic rock. So I listened to groups like uh, The Who, uh, Genesis, The Kinks. I saw Pink Floyd in concert. Um, And now I listen more to country music. In fact, I was supposed to, all right, I was so bummed. I was supposed to go last weekend to Garth Brooks. And and it was awesome. I got invited to go backstage and meet Garth Brooks. I've never met Garth Brooks. I'm not someone who generally hangs out with like famous musicians, but it was cool. I got an invitation. Hey, you want to come back and meet Garth Brooks? I was like, holy cow, I would love to. The concert was in Houston Saturday night. We were in D.C. all night voting on Voterama Saturday night. So not only did I see the Democrats bankrupt America, jack up taxes, pass a bill that will increase gas prices, increase inflation, but I missed the friggin' Garth Brooks concert. So it, it, <laughs> it completely bummed me out. Uh, and and the, the, the fellow who had invited me to go, he, he sent me pictures from the concert, which, which was a little bit like sort of rubbing salt in the wounds. I'm like, yeah, that concert looks pretty amazing. And I'm 
I'm down in the basement of the Capitol right now. And wow, that's that's not where I am. If it makes you feel any better, Senator, I'm not convinced that you have not met Garth Brooks because I have never seen Garth Brooks and Glenn Beck in the same room at the same time. So I'm not making any accusations here. It's just to me a little bit suspect. Those two guys, I don't know. It's kind of Clark I, I will situation. say, by the way, this this year, earlier this year, I was supposed to take the family to George Strayton concert at the Houston Rodeo. And uh, we were coming back from spring break. We had been skiing and we ended up missing our plane. And so this has been a bad year for concerts because I've had two concerts I was completely psyched to go to, George Strait and Garth Brooks, and I missed them both, which uh, which really sucked. But I did get to see the Eagles in concert uh, this year, which was an amazing concert. So I enjoyed that. Uh, but I would say, I don't know that I necessarily have one favorite band, but I'd say it used to be classic rock. Now it has shifted more country. And probably Smokey Mike and the God King, I assume, is a favorite of yours. I mean, we can get it more into it, you know, at a later date. Uh, we will be getting into a lot more at a later date because we are now accepting applications for the YAF campus tour. If you want to submit your school as a possible venue for the YAF campus tour, you go to yaf.org slash verdict. We had lots of fun last time. We went down to Texas A&M. We went to Yale. We've been all over the place. So go submit your schools. Uh, we're going to be doing three campuses. Apply today, yaf.org slash verdict. But before we go on the road, there is so much more to discuss, and that will be on The Cloakroom with our friend Liz Wheeler. Liz, what are you going to be talking about? So what we're going to talk about on Cloakroom today is actually a continuation of what you talked about on Verdict today, and it's this distrust that the American people feel in our government institutions and what the recourse for this is. Because there is this feeling in our country of hopelessness. What do we do to counter, you know, the FBI's abuse of power when they raided Mar-a-Lago? And in the wake, actually, of the Inflation Reduction Act or so-called Inflation Reduction Act, people are also talking about this as it relates to fiscal responsibility in our country. There's a movement called Convention of States that's proposing an idea but this isn't widely accepted in the conservative movement or the Republican Party. So we are going to break down what this is, what the pros and the cons of this are, and if it would be workable. And if it's workable, how would we prepare for this? So it's going to be very in-depth, very nitty gritty, and exactly what conversation our country needs to have on how to solve these issues. You can join us at verdictwithtedcruz.com slash plus. My promo code, as always, is cloakroom. You can watch for free for a month on your annual subscription verdict with tedcruz.com slash plus. And we'll see if we get a new constitution or some changes to our constitution. I look forward to it, but that's all for me. I'm Michael Knowles. This is Verdict with Ted Cruz. This episode of Verdict with Ted Cruz is being brought to you by Jobs, Freedom, and Security PAC, a political action committee dedicated to supporting conservative causes, organizations, and candidates across the country. In 2022, Jobs, Freedom, and Security PAC plans to donate to conservative candidates running for Congress and help the Republican Party across the nation. If you like this video, you should click the like button, and then you should subscribe, and you should ring the bell, and you will never miss another video.